uh, very, very uh, serious problems, generating very serious problems. Uh, there was one thing that I, I, now I forgot. Oh, think of a plant. I, I heard, heard you talking and I thought plants. So think of invasive plants. Those are really hard to eliminate. Once, if they become established, it's really hard to go and pluck plant by plant uh, uh, the um, uh, invasive plant. And then uh, just in general, mammals are easier to uh, eradicate, eliminate than invertebrates because we can see them, we have measures of, of catching them and uh, removing them. From an animal welfare point, people get really, really upset with images of you know helicopters uh, shooting uh, pigs, even though they are feral and they are not supposed to be on that island. Uh, a lot of you know animal welfare, um, uh, the animal welfare community generally gets very, uh, very, I don't know, uh, shaken by this idea of just going in there and shooting the animals because it's not the animals' fault they are there, <laughs> but unfortunately they are uh, generating. Um, Quite a disaster where they are introduced. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. May I have a question here? Yes, of course. <coughs> uh, so, sometimes some experts advise uh, to use uh, uh, biological control for mm -hmm. eradication. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, there are uh, actually there are a number of uh, eradication methods for plants for animals, but mostly uh, biological control is advised, so what do you think? We, we have, uh, you are right, biological control is a viable and used method throughout the world. And I, you know, I, I have colleagues at, at USDA and they go prospecting, for example, we have an invasive species in the United States, a crop pest, they go prospecting in the native range of the species in, in Africa or Asia to find out the, the natural enemy of that insect and then they want to introduce that insect into the United States to control that pest that now is present in the United States. So this is, this is actually, I think it's a common practice, biological control. But we, we have so many examples of biological control gone, gone really bad that I'm reluctant to be supportive of, of this method. But it's, it is a, a, I think it's a widespread method. That, that's why I'm, I'm just a bit confused because some experts say uh, for um, expanding of invasive species as uh, biological control, and the other experts say one of the methods for eradication of invasive species is bi biological control. So these two things are a bit uh, confused for me. And it depends on who you talk to. Um, if we would have had a you know, an agricultural extension expert in here, or a forestry expert, I think they will tell you, yes, for this, for this uh, insect, you can introduce this species and it will be great. You know, it will maintain the population at low, low density and it will do the job. Um, and probably a lot of the um, biological control um, actions have not generated disasters, but again, we have examples that have been disastrous and I'm not, I'm not very <laughs> happy and, and eager to say yes, biological control is the uh, answer. Yes, I think the answer is the answer. Biological control is one of the options. And before biological control, integrated pest management. So Evan is referring to IPM means integrated pest management. And this is an agricultural practice that, uh, sorry, my computer has a little issue here. Um, yeah, it's an agricultural practice that uh, does a little bit of uh, biological control. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but before any intervention of natural enemies, there has to be cost management tests mm -hmm. that are very specific to the area. So if you wanted to uh, introduce a pest or an invasive species of a plant in this country, you have to test uh, its, its effect on all the other relatives of this. To make sure you are not creating, uh, you are not uh, going to reduce the native species that are uh, related to this uh, yeah. invasive species, so they could act as host by uh, just by relating. Relating. Yeah. So I don't think there is much to be scared of. Science always has been at risk. Uh, so to, to So we have Emily over here who is 
full biological control, which is perfect. I guess the perfect thing. Okay. <laughs> so you can probably guess what I'm going to say. <laughs> Uh, no, no. I, I think I, I don't think science has the answer here. I think you have to blend in some of the ecological as well as the social context for this. We often think we have solutions for particular issues without actually going deeper into it. Um, questions of biological control often are looked at in terms of narrow time scales and shorter solutions, and that doesn't necessarily translate, especially when there isn't a political will to uh, make this as big a deal as maybe some of the pest managers might think is that, oh, it's no big deal, it's fine, don't worry about it. And we often find many cases that that's simply not the case, especially when your uh, resources are limited. So, so I would second uh, Mona's point that I think we should think about how lots of control as of last resort. One, uh, sorry, I skipped the 10 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. First, is it possible to generalize that one species in one invasive species, for example, one species invasive in one country, so can we generalize this species to be an invasive species in another country? The other one is, is the eradication of the situation because every species without its own quality, so I should be one for the other species. Very, very good point. And uh, so the second point, we'll come back to the second point, because indeed, uh, in some cases, biologists tend to just scream uh, murder and, and, you know, be very, very afraid of, of invasive species and trying to eradicate, when in reality, they may not be such a big problem. And we end up investing a lot of resources into uh, eradicating uh, either um, we invest them in uh, without uh, thinking about the low effects they may have, that species may have, or the low likelihood of us really eradicating, eradicating that species. So at the end of this presentation, I have a few, I have a, a high profile paper and then responses to that high profile paper, but the high profile paper had this point, uh, one of the points they had was this. And then your other question had to do with uh, how what can we say about the likelihood of a species invading a, a country if we know it has already invaded a country, another country? And again, that has to do with comparing the ecology, comparing the uh, climate, um, and creating some sort of uh, risk analysis or, or uh, yeah, a risk analysis based on the potential distribution of the species. So if we have uh, climatically similar um, environmentally similar uh, regions in the two countries, we, I think we should be uh, concerned with this one species in the country. Because it's all based on what kind of environments, environmental conditions the species uh, require uh, to survive. I can give you one practical example. Uh, for example, most of these people are here in the city of Ethiopia. It has a bad history in India, but when you go to, to Tanzania, they are selling the seeds to farmers to, to grow very aggressively. Yes. When I told them, they neglect my idea. Don't worry, we are using the water for some purposes. Mm -hmm. But the plant is growing well because they want to see that. Yes. So how can we have this species? That I think that has to do with the lack of communication between, you know, agroforestry, uh, industry, and, I know, biodiversity conservation uh, uh, agency, let's say. Because it may be good for one purpose, but very good for the other purpose. For, for, purpose. So for, uh, because we don't have good communication between agencies, we give uh, people uh, mixed messages, mixed signals. And we have this problem in the United States, there are examples where we have a, a plant species that is on uh, the no noxious list or list of you know corn worst species to, to handle, and then we have nurseries that are actually selling seedlings of that particular. So it takes a while for the uh, for the horticulture in this case industry to pick it up and and start uh, selling it. So yes, there is a. Uh, lag and disconnect between um, 
I guess, different agencies and different uh, mm -hmm. yes. Can you say that if one species uh, is invited for one country, uh, definitely will be invited for another country? I can give an example, for example, for your piece, maybe, yeah, definitely, uh, invasive species totally, mm -hmm. uh, it damages a lot of things, uh, but can it definitely be invasive for other country? Again, not mm -hmm. definitely, but if the uh, environmental uh, conditions are similar, you are more likely to have a species successful in the two, if the two countries or the two regions are environmentally similar, there is a higher chance, a higher likelihood that the species will be doing very well in both uh, regions. And that, that's why I think ecological niche modeling is pretty useful, at least a first, as a first approach to, the, to um, analyzing this problem because it gives us a model, it quantifies the um, ecological uh, conditions that are suitable for that species based on what we know uh, about that species, based on known presences and environmental data associated with those presences. So at least we have a first approximation of what, what kind of environmental conditions uh, that species requires for, for survival and where in, uh, on the landscape, where in geography those conditions are found. But yeah, we cannot, just country by country, you cannot say. But if we know that the two regions are similar, I think it's, it's uh, reasonable to start to be concerned with the species. It's all in the ecology of the species, I would say. I'm not I haven't convinced you. Let's proceed, okay. Okay, so I have, I have here the fact that because we have so many species to deal with, uh, so many introduced species to deal with, we, like I said, we need to prioritize, figure out which ones are most, uh, most uh, of mo highest concern and deal with those first. And then, as, as we already talked about, we have biological control, we also have chemical control, and we have manual removal, which takes a lot of manpower. But um, these, are, uh, these kinds of actions, um, the manual removal, are becoming uh, more common, at least in the United States, because they are part of the citizen science and involving citizens into uh, nature projects and conservation projects. So, you know, we ask of people to go into this region that has been, um, has been um, invaded by a, a plant, or generally it's plants, and then people go and, you know, pluck the plants out and they feel good that they are doing something, they are manually removing some, uh, at least uh, those invasive, uh, at least part of or uh, a percent of that, uh, of that population. Okay. So, um, here what I wanted to, s uh, to say, uh, this is going to Tamena's point, um, it is impractical to control or eliminate every introduced species. It is definitely impractical and, and impossible. Uh, mostly to do that, for the most part, to do that. And then um, many introduced species do um, tend to be, to stay at low density and have uh, little effect or, or, or uh, minor effects on, on those ecosystems. So uh, we, sh we don't need to be uh, worrying about all species, especially these ones that have minor um, effects uh, at the ecosystem level. And then also, those species that are naturalized, that have been here for hundreds of years, it's clear that we are not going to remove them. They are here to stay and they are part of the uh, uh, ecosystem currently. Just as with the example, the fish uh, diversity example, we have now so much homogenization that it would be impossible to uh, try to get back to the original state of, um, of uh, let's say, fish diversity in the United States basin. Okay, I think Oh, hey, so this is, this is the um, paper I was telling you about. So this was a paper that was published in 2011. It's actually a comment, and it says, it's titled, Don't Judge Species on Their Origin. As, it, as you can see, it has a lot of authors, um, and they were trying to make a few points, of uh, some of uh, which you already uh, alluded to, or you actually uh, formulated the same points that they were trying to make. So first one, um, Specifically, policy and management decision must take into account the positive effects of many invaders. So this is a strong statement. What they are saying is, look, some invaders actually have a positive effect 
on in that particular ecosystem. This is, you know, uh, quite quite a statement to make. Um, to give you an example, a recent example, uh, this is um, a plant, uh, tamaris, uh, that has been introduced in the United States, I think late 1800s, early 1900s, a long time ago, uh, was introduced to control soil erosion on riverbanks, and this plant really liked uh, soil uh, um, riverbanks and established pretty well. So it became quickly, it quickly became invasive. Well, not quickly, but over decades became invasive. Uh, recent efforts tried to uh, to control and, and and reduce the population of tamarisk along uh, riverways, river banks, especially the ones that are of conservation con uh, concern, by introducing a beetle. So uh, this is biological control in action. They found uh, the researchers found uh, an insect, a beetle, that uh, chews down the uh, leaves and. Um, not necessarily, that it does not kill the uh, tamarisk trees, but it, uh, it lowers the, um, at least lowers the uh, likelihood of the species to, uh, to expand. But there is a subspecies of flycatcher that has, uh, has uh, start, uh, well, is using uh, the tamarisk trees for uh, breeding. Um, it's, it appears that it, uh, uh, it can use this type of habitat. So when uh, US, I think it was USDA, I can't remember which, which agency came up with this management uh, procedure, let's introduce the beetle, the beetle will control the uh, tamarisk population. Uh, a certain, I mean, a part of, a, uh, part of the conservation world um, pointed out that, hey, you are, you are now affecting this species. So this is an example of positive uh, influence the tamarisk has a positive influence because it provides habitat for this uh, for this uh, uh, threatened uh, subspecies of flycatcher. So uh, this is, I guess, one illustration uh, of one in introduced species that now has a positive effect, at least for this one uh, threatened or species of concern, subspecies of conservation concern. Another point that they were trying to make with this paper was that the management plans should be based on empirical evidence and not claims of harm ca caused by non-natives. In other words, don't just be immediately alarmed and afraid of an invasive species and start managing for that invasive species. Gather empirical evidence to make sure that you are not wasting resources and effort for a species of uh, trying to er eradicate a species that may not be uh, that, um, that much of a threat. And then uh, again, coming back to this point, many uh, alien or introduced species are could be uh, could be useful. And then um, I like this this bit about conservationists. Uh, they are not suggesting to us conservationists that we should abandon our efforts to mitigate serious problems, but th they urge us to organize priorities around whether species are producing benefits or harm harm to biodiversity. So what they are trying to say is, look. Don't, don't be alarmed immediately. Try to find uh, evidence uh, for uh, uh, negative effects. And if you find evidence that, uh, if you find that an invasive species has positive effects, just let it go. There are so many species, let it go. How do you think this particular uh, paper was received by us, the conservation community? Yay, everybody excited about this paper? <laughs> Not so much. First, 141 scientists object. Um, Non-natives put biodiversity at risk. Non-native spouses of invasion ecology. Non-natives for risk factors. So we were not happy with this paper. We, uh, meaning the con not, not us in this room necessarily, but the, the general community, uh, at large, the community uh, had uh, some strong responses in the same, obviously, they wrote letters to Nature after this commentary was uh, was published. Who were the authors on the original? Uh, no, not very yet. Me first. Okay, is Chris A bunch. Uh, Simberloff had his uh, like non-natives, uh, he's objecting to this. <laughs> yeah, one dynamic here is, and I don't know much about it, but apparently they spent lots of money in 
uh, amateur effort in Britain, eradicating invasive plants mm -hmm. uh, that aren't doing any particular harm. And I think people are sort of yeah. stirred up and people in Britain have a little bit different perspective than people in other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, how are we doing 